interesting times we live in, and I've appreciated my friends, uh, my doctor friends. Uh, well, we've got two physicians who would certainly like to help heal America, uh, but we have people in powerful positions in the Senate as well as the White House that don't appear to be interested in their prescriptions. Uh, I sure am, and I appreciate their observations. Uh, also, they alluded to uh, some of the energy issues before us in the country right now, and that's certainly worth noting. Um, but first, I, I want to address something that uh, we're hearing that the president, over and over and over, he's spending millions and millions of tax dollars running around the country telling people that the cure to what ails us and the cure to all unfairness is the Buffett rule. And we're told that since Warren Buffett uh, may pay a lower percentage than his secretary, uh, Warren Buffett and the president are saying we need to tax the wealthy more. And uh, we found out the president pays uh, apparently a lower tax rate than his secretary, 20% um, compared to a higher percentage that his secretary pays. And it leaves some of us baffled. If somebody really feels that it's fairness or a moral issue for Warren Buffett and the president to pay more taxes than their secretaries, then at least have the morality to do it. Don't come to Congress and say, we demand you pass laws to force us to do the morally right thing because we're not going to do the morally right thing unless Congress passes a law making me, Warren Buffett, me, President Obama, do the right thing. We can't control ourselves and make ourselves do the morally proper thing, the fair thing, unless Congress passes a law. Really? Is that what we've come to? that the leader of the free world just down Pennsylvania Avenue has to have Congress pass a law to get him to do what he says is the moral and fair thing to do? Come on. Are, are we in that bad of shape now? I've had one of the smarter economists in the country, Art Laffer, Ronald Reagan's uh, economic advisor. What a great guy. Serves good spaghetti and meatballs at his home in Nashville. I've personally gotten to try out. Uh, wonderful family, delightful family, brilliant economist. I've had him explain to me how anybody who says we're going after the rich, we're going to go after the rich and we're going to make them pay their fair share. Probably not being honest. They're just probably not being honest because if they think through their proposal, if they will at current history, if they will look at immediate past history and long past history, what they find is this. If you're a union worker, if you're a mechanic, if you're working on an oil well somewhere, if you are working as a waitress, you're working in a restaurant, you're working in a pharmacy, you're working in any of millions of businesses across America, and you're not rich, you're part of the working middle class, you cannot move if you get taxed a higher amount because you are reliant on that job. So taxes, no matter what kind of tax you put in place, it's most likely only going to affect those who are in the middle class no matter what else you do because only the wealthy are not tied to a restaurant, to a, a uh, car company, to an auto manufacturer, 
to an auto repair place, they're not tied to those. They can own them, and they can live in the next state or the next country, but they don't have to actually live at the place of business they're making money from. So when you go after the wealthiest in America and want to make them do the morally fair thing because without Congress passing a law, these wealthiest among us can't make themselves do the moral and fair thing according to their own words. Uh, gee, we can't do it unless Congress makes us. What you do is tell me we're going to slap a big old tax on you and the wealthy can say, no, thank you. I look stupid, perhaps, but I'm not that stupid. That's how I've either gained or been able to hold on to my wealth. So I'm moving. I'm voting on where I want to live with my feet. And they pick up and they go to where there's less, less taxes. We've seen it in the wealthiest moving from country to another country or Ireland, or buying an island. We've seen that repeatedly. And if the government says, well, gee, we'll outsmart the wealthiest among us, they move to another country, so we'll figure out a new way to go after the wealthiest. And every time it fails to work. So after a while, you get the idea, wait, let's look historically. Every time a city state or nation goes after the wealthiest people in the world to make them pay higher taxes unless the whole world collaborated at the same time to make it happen they will simply move the middle class cannot do that the middle class does not have that luxury if you're very wealthy and gas goes to $4 or $5 a gallon, it's an inconvenience. And you can't be tied up with trivial details like gas going up a dollar a gallon or $2 a gallon, or like it has under this present, go from a dollar eighty or so up to 4 and now we're heading toward 5 And in some places I have seen 5 uh, certainly over five for um, for some time this year in some of the premium gasoline lines. So the wealthiest, they're not really bothered. It's an inconvenience. Uh, they can choose to live in an estate out in the country. They can choose to live in a town home worth millions at the top of a building in the middle of town. Or they can choose to live on an island. They can choose to live anywhere. And because of the Internet, the telephone, uh, Internet meetings, the wealthiest among us can do their business from anywhere. So it becomes very clear that the only reason somebody really intelligent that understands what's going on and is willing to look at the historical precedent Anybody that, that's really going to be fair will realize the only reason they would say we're going after the wealthiest among us is for political gain because they're going to drive them out of the country otherwise or drive them out of the state or city where the taxes are going to be raised dramatically. The thing to do that's fair for those of us who want those making more money to pay more and those who are making less money to pay less, those of us that feel that way have many of us begun to say, you know, to do that, let's have a flat tax. Some, like Steve Forbes, have been saying it for a long time. The Heritage Foundation has got a, a, a new flat tax proposal that looks to have wonderful merit. Uh, there are a number of flat tax proposals. Uh, Steve Forbes was at 17% flat tax, doesn't matter how much I make. Um, my conversations with uh, Art Laffer, he said you could have a flat tax and actually even be lower than 17%, uh, or than 17%. Uh, 
I'm looking forward to getting the full details um, and have two deductions, one for uh, home mortgage interest and one for charitable uh, contributions. And I'm not talking about when you give underwear to uh, some charity and say, congratulations, you now got my undergarments. I'm talking about, you know, real charitable contributions. Um, make those things deductible, but otherwise eliminate all the loopholes. Whether it's 12, 17, the economy would explode. There would be more jobs available. And at this time when there are so many that are just on the edge of desperation, when they don't know what they're going to do, they can't keep paying $4 a gallon for gas. For those who have been looking so long, the millions that are out of work because they've just gotten tired of looking, so they're not counted in the unemployment numbers. So we realize, gee, the unemployment is probably much, much, much worse than the administration is telling folks. For those folks, I'd like to provide a little hope. It won't be under this administration, but if we have a different president and we get a different majority in the Senate, it truly ought to be springtime in America, figuratively as it is literally right now. We now know, many of us, we could be energy independent. So when I got to Congress, I didn't think so. The natural gas we found is extraordinary. And how have we done it? The technology has gotten so good at slanting holes. The technology has gotten, gotten so good in sealing the hole and fracking a formation. And for those that understand how it works, if you do not have a sealed formation there and you frack, then you've lost the formation. There will be no pressure to bring the oil or gas up. We've also had hearings in natural resource resources, and Chairman Doc Hastings has done a great job there. We've had hearings, and we've discussed a lot of these things. And we have some chicken littles in uh, the Interior Department, Energy Department, and the EPA running around saying, gee, hydraulic fracking keeps polluting drinking water. They've shut wells down. And each time when they brought in the scientific study to actually analyze, because there have been some drinking water that's been polluted by something, but when they analyze, they find there is not anything that was utilized in the hydraulic fracking process that was able to make its way through the thousands of feet of rock, of rock formations to get to the drinking water and that there is nothing in the polluted drinking water that could possibly have come from the fracking. Yet this president keeps saying, I'm for all of the above. And the best I can figure is when he says, I'm for all of the above energy process, it means I'm for anything we don't get out of the ground. So we'll give hundreds of millions, actually billions of dollars to dear friends who have bundled money for the president's re-election and original election, and we'll give them those billions of dollars and say, go try to make solar panels, even though it's not uh, financially uh, feasible, it's not a viable enterprise, go do it, and I will help you by giving billions of dollars, 42% uh, percent of which we're having to borrow, We'll give them all that money. You know, someday we should be able to use solar energy. But for heaven's sake, we should not be depriving our Social Security funds of money while this president is giving away billions of dollars to cronies for energy ideas that don't work and that are not feasible and that are bankrupting America. 
And yet that's what's been happening. 2% payroll tax cut for workers to divide Americans. Seniors have been told, you know what, um, you don't have to worry. This Democratic administration is going to make sure we take care of our seniors. And the very times that's being said, they are gutting the Social Security Trust Fund, even though it's our use going in there. There's Social Security tax money that has been coming in since the 1930s in, in enough sufficiency to pay for the outgoing checks. It was not supposed to be for many years that we were supposed to reach that point where there was more Social Security money going out than Social Security money coming in. Well, this president doubled down, and in an, what is a divisive, or I guess use his terminology, divisive, dismissive gesture from this administration, we have undercut our seniors. This administration has been pushing to gut the Social Security Trust Fund, and it has done so. Now, the friends in the mainstream media trying to cover for the president, they're not talking about the fact that last year there was 5% of Social Security payments that we didn't have money to pay from the Social Security Trust Fund payments coming in. So we had to borrow around 42% of the rest, and we had to take tax money to make up the rest. And there's projections that though it was a 5% shortfall last year, it will likely be 14 or 15% this year. That's not a good road to stay on. It is a road to Greece. It is a road that will so undercut our senior citizens who deserve better from every administration, including this one. Seniors have been hurt by this administration, 5% last year, 15% this year, and if we don't get a different administration and a different majority in the Senate, it's going to be worse after that. Could it be 45% the next year? If it triples in one year, could it triple again? We're in trouble if we continue the policies of this administration. Now, the EPA today, since hydraulic fracking has brought us somewhere 100 to 300 years of natural gas, even at vastly uh, expanded rates of usage, we could be energy independent. We could put not merely city buses on natural gas, but move cars to natural gas. At the same time, the Bakken play up in North Dakota has found a huge amount of oil we didn't realize we had. In, in northeast Utah, northwest Colorado, southwest Wyoming, we're told there's tremendous amounts of energy we're told there's clean coal technology. And what's the answer of this administration? Let's shut down any use of coal. Why? Because this administration has all of the above as their energy policy, which means they're not going to use coal because it comes from underground. We in the United States have been blessed beyond measure. We have more natural resources, more energy than any nation in the world. China, Russia, you name it. We've got more natural energy than anywhere. And this administration has continued to put our energy off limits second largest coal deposit in the world, in Utah, we're told, was put off limits by President Clinton. This administration, you know, of all the campaign promises, you would hope the administration wouldn't break, or uh, could break, you would hope they would break the, hope they would break the promise to see 
energy prices necessarily skyrocket. I would love to have seen that promise broken, yet that seems to be one of the very few that's been kept. Energy prices have necessarily skyrocketed. And then we find out today because hydraulic fracking has delivered the ability for this nation to become energy independent, today the EPA has declared war on hydraulic fracking. People are desperate. The rich, we've seen how this works. The president calls the wealthiest among us, the Wall Street folks, fat cats. All they have to endure is a little name calling from the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, and in return they get richer than they've ever been. Most people can endure a little name calling by an individual when they know the individual is going to see that they're wealthier than ever. Wall Street has done pretty well under this administration. It's done a lot better than most of America. Americans deserve better. The president says he's going after big oil, declaring war on big oil. Well, this is one of the few areas where the president actually does have a sub substantive plan to go after what he calls big oil. Well, we've learned from the way Wall Street's been handled, call them names but make them richer than ever, say you're going to war against big oil, and what happens? We get this proposal in writing from the president. This is his Jobs Act. And the subtitle D of the President's Jobs Act is entitled Repeal Oil Subsidies. Well, that word is extremely disingenuous. The President uses it all the time. But the word, if you look it up, means a grant or gift of money. There is no grant or gift of money. There are tax deductions for expenses. So... He says he's going after big oil, but you look at the specific deductions that he now has in print that he is going after big oil with, and what do you find? You find out these deductions don't help big oil companies. It's so marginal, it's a drop to them. Who it will devastate and put out of business are the independent oil and gas operators who drill 95% of all the oil and gas wells in the continental U.S. There is a repeal in here by the president uh, of the deduction for intangible drilling and developmental costs in the case of oil and gas wells. There is a repeal of the percentage depletion for oil and gas wells. There's repeal of the deduction for injectants. There's a repeal of oil and gas working interest exceptions to passive activity rules. Now, if, if anybody is interested in really finding out the truth, they can go to major oil companies and ask them, would these repeals of these deductions really hurt you as a major oil company in the world? And the answer would be, no, not really. You can go to the accountants for independent oil and gas operators and say, if these are repealed, would it affect independent oil and gas operators who drill 95% of the oil wells in the continental U.S.? And the answer is, it will devastate them. Not only is he going after the deductions that keep them afloat, they're going after the investment in oil and gas wells by the mainstream public. Now, if you're British Petroleum or Exxon, you don't put out a proposal that says we're drilling a well, and here's the proposal, here's the geology, here's the other wells in the area, here's what we think it will do, and you invest X amount of dollars, and we will give you an X percentage amount of the working interest in this well. That's the kind of proposal independent oil and gas companies have to make to get investments for people to invest in their oil well. If they hit a gusher, hit a huge well, 
then those who invest and take a percentage of the well will do very well. They hit a dry hole, then they lose money. And when you invest in a dry hole and it costs you money, you would hope you'd be able to deduct your expenses of the investment that failed. What this president is doing not only is going to destroy the independent oil companies by taking away deductions that keep them afloat and keep them able to keep drilling another well, he's going after their investments. So once you, you begin to see these specifics, you realize, and there's some other things in here, repeal of marginal well production credit, uh, repeal of enhanced oil recovery. There, there are a number that when you see the specifics, you realize, oh, wow, maybe he doesn't know that he will destroy oil and gas independent operators. Maybe he doesn't know. But it doesn't take a genius to realize if you put oil and gas operators out of business, who are the independents? who are not big enough to have all the employees they need to do the drilling, who have so many subcontractors, who go out and eat and go uh, to the entertainment places, and they go invest in things around town, and they go buy clothes. Those people, those subcontractors, their subcontractors, all of those people will be without anything to do because this administration says it declared war on major oil, but instead, it's really a war against independence. Stop 95% of the drilling for oil and gas in the continental U.S. Then what happens to major oil? You've eliminated all of their competition among the small independents. Well, what does that mean? Well, there's only a small number of massive international oil and gas companies comparatively and you've wiped out their competition in America it means they will charge more for gasoline more for diesel and there's nothing we can do about it because they're the only ones that have any energy right now before this president finishes driving or trying to put independence out of business we've got to stop this train wreck that's coming this should be springtime in America. It should be a time of renaissance. People shouldn't have to pay $4 a gallon. And as soon as this president takes substantive actions, just to announce that he's going to take substantive actions, not to declare war on hydraulic fracking as they have now, not to declare war on oil companies in North Dakota because there have been eight mallards that died and that had some oil on them, and therefore, they have the Justice Department under the president's thumb who is prosecuting their oil companies for violation of the Migratory Bird Act. Even though they've got windmills they support that are chopping them up by the thousands and thousands. No, don't go after the windmills. They're above. So when the president says he's for all of the above, that includes all of the wind being generated here in Washington and other places where there are windmills that are driven by the hot air. It's time to start saying what we mean so that when this president tells the leader of Israel, I have your back, the leader of Israel doesn't realize he's got to put on something that will stop a knife coming from the back. It's time for our allies to know we support our friends and we're going to stop supporting and trying to buy off our enemies. It's time to bring peace and prosperity back to the continental U.S., all 50 states, all our territories, by truly having an all-of-the-above energy policy. And if we want to pursue renewables, don't be letting the Social Security Trust Fund or the tax money dry up and leave seniors so vulnerable. Don't take away $500 billion from Medicare and hurt the seniors like that, as Obamacare has done. Don't do those things. If you want to go spend, if you want to go spend billions giving it to your friends in uh, solar energy, 
for heaven's sake, let's start leasing the federal land like it used to be done. And then use 25% royalty. Use part of our royalty to throw away on the president's friends. Not be borrowing from China. Not be taxing people to give to his buddies. And we can return to springtime in America. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back. The gentleman yields back.